everybody. This is Colin podcasting about real estate and welcome to show 17. So my guest today is Alexander Cruz from Baltimore, Maryland. He works for a large uh, flipping company and property management company called CR of Maryland. He's a very experienced investor who's done a ton of work in the last 10 years. We had a pretty wide ranging interview and we talked about how Alex got started in real estate as a broker's assistant, how he pivoted to working and later partnering with a very successful house flipper how they change their focus from flipping to, to building and holding a portfolio of hundreds of properties, at the types of properties Alex and his colleagues buy in Baltimore, why Baltimore and, and the misconceptions a lot of people have about that city, how they're selling renovated upper middle class homes that meet the 1% rule, not too many of them around, uh, they talk about the teams and the systems they use for, for buying on market and off market properties, talk about COVID and how that rocked their business back in March and April and how they bounced back and the adjustments they've made. He had some great advice as well for people, young people, older people that want to accelerate their real estate journeys and get started and, and much more. So great interview and I think you're going to enjoy it. Uh, before that, just bear in mind that I do have a website that you can check out when you have a minute. It is colininvestments.com, C-O-L-I-N investments.com. You can download free real estate reports. You can access the podcast videos and the audio files. You can schedule a call to have a chat with me about any real estate questions or concerns you might have. I'm also on social media. You'll find me on, on Twitter, on Instagram, on, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. You'll find all those on, on the websites as well. Most of them are under Colin Investment or Colin G. Murphy. So you'll find me online on the YouTube channel as well. So reach out, get in touch. Let me know what you're thinking. Let me know what you're doing. And uh, yeah, that's enough for me. Let's head on over to my guest, Alexander, and see what he has to say. Alex, how you doing, man? Great to have you on the show. Doing great, Colin. How are you? I'm great. I'm doing good, man. So for those of us who don't know you, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. And uh, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. So mm -hmm. um, my name is Alexander. I actually go by Xander. That's my nickname. And I am the Director of Acquisitions and Sales at CR of Maryland. Uh, we're a real estate investment company located and founded in Baltimore. Um, I also specifically am the turnkey director, which is, of course, how you and I met uh, at an event in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, that's that's a long story short. I'm sure we'll dig more into all of that. But uh, we will. Yeah. Well, let's before we dig into what you're doing now. And I know CEO of Maryland's doing some great things and a lot of deals in, in the Baltimore area. Let's rewind the clock a little bit. Tell me a bit about your your earlier life, your kind of first jobs and your, your first experiences in real estate. Sure. Yeah. So growing up, uh, I, I never had even a taste of real estate. Uh, my mother works in education and my dad works in uh, warehousing and fulfillment. So I actually spent a couple of grueling summers as a teenager working in uh, hot, dusty warehouses. So uh, I'm not sure that that really prepared. And me is that in, in Baltimore? Yeah, in, I'm free here in Baltimore. Yeah. Um, so I finished college in 2011. I uh, got home in didn't really know what to do. It was not still a great economy. We hadn't really kind of clicked back to things from True. 2008. Mm -hmm. um, so my parents called a local broker to uh, list their house. They were planning to move locally. And uh, while the broker was there, she offered me a job uh, to be her assistant. Uh, I had nothing else to do. And I said, well, why not? Uh, <laughs> let's go for it. So uh, the first day in the office, the, the first thing I realized and noticed was how much energy there was and, and how fast paced people were flying in and out. The phone kept ringing. Everybody needed something right away. And uh, I was pretty quickly hooked. So uh, I worked for her for a year. In that mm -hmm. year, I very quickly got my real estate license. Um, and within probably a month, I realized I'm, I'm not a great admin person. Uh, I was working hard, but uh, details like paperwork are not really my thing. Wow. Um, but why do you think she year, asked you to, to be her assistant just from that house sale? Did she see something in you? Did you do something that, that caught her attention? Yeah. So it was in between the first meeting and the second meeting. Uh, I did a lot of the uh, work around the house in terms of getting it ready, uh, the house prep stuff for listing. Ah, okay. And uh, she was impressed by it. And, and I think she also liked that I was young and impressionable uh, and willing to work. So uh, I checked those boxes and I guess I had a pulse. So she said, why don't you come try it out? Um, okay. I come to find out later, there's a lot of turnover in that position. She's a pretty tough boss. 
<laughs> but uh, I have all the respect for it. And I learned so much in that first year. And that was really like my launch pad into real estate. So uh, after the first year, I stayed with the brokerage uh, just okay. as an independent agent. I stepped out of the admin role, went out on my own. Uh, and, and did that for a, a time. Like as a normal realtor trying to look, look yeah, for listings? Re re correct. Regular residential real estate. Um, so in that time, within the next two years, is when I was introduced to Craig, who's my current business partner. Um, and in the beginning, we, we did not have a business partner relationship, uh, but, that, but that's when we began working together in Baltimore. Um, and actually, we were introduced by the broker. Uh, so maybe a lesson there that you never want to burn a bridge. You yeah, don't meet yeah. too many. I mean, I, I've met obviously a lot of investors over the year, and I don't think that that many of them started out as a regular realtor and then moved on to become a, an investor. Because if you're a realtor, I found it's very easy to kind of get stuck in that world and get stuck in that comfort zone where you're making a comfortable living, but you're you're yeah. working your ass off to make a comfortable living. And it literally might not change much from 25 to 45, you know what I mean? And yep. you don't hear about how, ma how many realtors retirement parties have you been to? They just, they, they just keep working until <laughs> they drop, you know? Yeah, that's very true. It's a, it's a different world. So I think I was fortunate. I was still young enough that I could make that pivot. I didn't have a family. Uh, you know, I was, I was mm -hmm. single. Uh, I just had a dog. So it was very easy for me to take the chance and start working on the investment side with my partner. So she introduced you to, to Craig, who's now your, your, your partner that you own the business with. What was, how did that work? What was, obviously Craig's a, a bit older than you. What was he doing at the time? And, and I guess he kind of took you under his, his wing a little bit, did he? So in the beginning, uh, to take, make a really long story short, Craig is from Baltimore and lives here. He had uh, started and owned a successful investment company in Pennsylvania because okay. he owned a previous business there. So for many years, he was commuting from Baltimore to Pennsylvania. Um, when we met is when he was first starting and, and recreating that same style business here in Baltimore. So he had an existing business in PA, but there was already somebody running it day to day. Mm -hmm. uh, so now at this point, uh, when we met, it was me, him, and one project manager here in Baltimore. So very quickly, in the, in the beginning, it was, uh, they were gonna, he was going to work with me to help acquire homes. Um, and then it grew, just grew from there very fast. I ended up wearing a lot of different hats. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very heavy boots on the ground. Um, I was also selling our, our properties when, they, when we were flipping them. So I uh, ended up doing a little bit of everything. And over the years, it just really grew from there. So what, what kind of growth did you have? I mean, can you remember any of the numbers, how many deals you did, you know, first year, second year, third year, what, what, what kind of, and were you flipping everything? Was, was, were you or Craig holding a lot? Yeah, so in that time, we were exclusively fix and flip. Uh -huh. uh, and it was modestly small in the beginning, bigger probably than most, I'll say, investors, but not compared to the big guys. So in the beginning, in the first year, I want to say we did maybe uh, two dozen deals, something like that. Mm -hmm. And then by uh, the third year, maybe the fourth year right in that range, uh, we were pushing about 100 deals. Uh, and these are all fix and flip homes. We buy, renovate, and resell. <clears throat> Um, and then nice. as you alluded to, our evolution after that uh, was when we got, learned about and then stuck our toe in and then dived in uh, into the rental business. So we began buying and renovating rental properties that we were going to hold on to uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, property manage. So, of course, we didn't know a lick about property management either. We had to uh, learn quickly. And then that's when we brought in uh, our third partner, who is Craig's son. His name is Brock. Um, okay. And Brock started our property management and built it from the ground up. Uh, and now today we manage over 370 properties in Baltimore, um, a large number of which we, we are the owners. And then uh, we, we sell now our new rentals under our turnkey model. That's pretty awesome because it's, it's a very, I mean, number one, making the, the transition from a realtor to investor is beneficial and, and fix and flipping can be very, you can earn a very good living fixing and flipping. I know a lot of people earning nice six figure salaries fixing and flipping um but a lot of them don't own that many properties you know and it was it was a trap i fell into for many years as well that it's very hard to turn down a quick 
twenty thousand dollar profit rather than sure. hold something for two or three hundred bucks a month after you pay the mortgage. I mean, what? And and the people that do that, they might you know they might own ten rentals or fifteen rentals. It's often very ad hoc, and they keep very random properties for for different weird reasons. There's no real thinking behind it. I, I get the impression that that you and Craig put a bit more thought into it otherwise you wouldn't have had you know 300 and something so what what did that look like do you remember those conversations that you had when you said we need to start holding more of these and we're going to do it this way and we're going to scale this way yeah <laughs> it's kind of funny you say that well two things one is uh you just triggered a thought it's very similar when, when you're a flip flipper and that's your only source of income it's almost like being a realtor and that's your only source because you're, yeah. you're always chasing the next deal you're as good as your last deal and that's it and the day you stop buying flips, you very quickly go out of business. So yep. uh, that that is definitely a tangible benefit to the rental side of the business, which uh, is what we love about it. But it started because we had a flip that wasn't selling. Right. Like, what are we going to do with this house? And then we're sitting there, we're like, well, let's look at numbers as a rental. Uh, so we ran the numbers and it, it, the numbers worked pretty well. Uh, so Craig called uh, our, our bank and he's like, um, we got this property, we haven't sold it. Um, we'd like to, we'd like to make it a rental and do a cash out refi. Can you let us know what it looked like? And the terms were killer. So we're like, Hmm. And he says, so I'll never forget it. He, he calls him, his name is Rory. And he goes, Rory, if I do more deals like this, how many, like, can you guys do? And Rory goes, I, I mean, a deal like that, it's, you know, it's 80% financing. Uh, it's fully renovated. It's a, a fixed interest rate. I mean, it's easy, like as many as you want. So Rory didn't realize that Craig is a really big thinker. And when right. he said as many as you want, he thought a handful was in the banker's mind. And Craig's mind was like, let's, let's go buy a hundred. So, <laughs> right. uh, so very quickly, we sent them like 10 more uh, not not flips, but this is over a few months as we bought and renovated specifically for the rental model. And then uh, Rory called back and he's like, whoa, uh, what are you guys doing? Why are you sending so many? He's like, Craig's like, well, he said it was unlimited. He goes, no, it's not actually unlimited. So really long story short, we had to find another bank to work with because this was a really small one, but that's mm -hmm. how it started. Uh, and then through some trial and error, we, we figured out what the ideal rental looks like here. Uh, the right price points, how the cash flow works, um, what we can rent stuff for, uh, how do we rent things quickly, and then of course, you know, how do you manage them afterwards to get people to stay? So uh, that's the that was the course. Did, did you slam on the brakes on the sales side and just spend six months, a year, a year and a half, just only buying, or did you do a kind of a mixture like selling thirty percent, keeping seventy percent? How, how did it Yeah, work? it was definitely a mix. I would say at its uh, highest point was probably like eighty percent of our renovations going were for rentals, and about twenty percent were still flipping. Um, as we were growing it, we really still needed that flipping income to, to keep paying the bills. We had grown to be a pretty sizable company at that point. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but let's say we had 15 employees back then. Oh, wow. Um, so we, we had to keep flipping. And then also, I didn't even touch on this, but we got into wholesaling as well. Uh, okay. Probably back in maybe 2015 or 2016. And we still do that today uh, as well. So um, we kind of cover all the bases. And now where we are, we have a very sizable rental portfolio. We do some wholesaling. We do a small number of flips, not a big number. It, it'll be less than probably 12 this year. Um, okay. And then our big focus is the turnkey model. So buying, renovating, and then uh, renting the property and selling it as a renovated, fully managed rental property. So. Okay. I mean, that's still a type of flipping, really. Yeah, it is. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You know, so what, what do you... So what do you look for? I mean, are the deals you, you, you sell different to the deals you keep? Uh, and or if they're different, describe each one. And if they're the same, describe what you consider to be you know, a good deal. What, what boxes sure. does it need to check? No, they're, they are exactly the same properties. We've actually now stopped buying rental properties for ourselves. Um, we've hit, uh, I'll say, a goal and then also kind of a limit. Uh, at the end of the day, there's only so much capital. And without borrowing money for down payments, things like that. It's not something we want to do. So we're very comfortable where we are. Don't want to stretch ourselves. Um, and again, have kind of built a nice 
I'll say the nest egg that is going to be there for the future. So, um, so the, the deals that we buy. And and by, by the way, just before I, the, 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 the properties you own, the rentals, um, do you have them all on long-term like 30 year notes or do you have a plan to pay them down in like 12 years, 15 years? Um, it's a, actually a mix. So we do have a plan to pay them down earlier. Most are the 20 or the 30 year uh, loans. So yes. Um, and then there's, we, we have a lot of discussions on strategy and, and things that we'll do over time. So, um, and not to get sidetracked, but there will likely be some form of a refinance at some point and likely yeah. also some form of a buyout of Craig. And so there's a whole lot of like different things going on over there. That All these champagne problems. It's, it's something that, yeah, you, you know, part of you is saying, yes, yeah, a couple of hundred units, let's just work hard on paying them off and then they'll throw off a ton of cash, but it's, you obviously sometimes it's not as simple as that. Sometimes you want to refi them so that you can buy something else. Sometimes you might want to sell them and move into class A office space or whatever, maybe not class A office space these days, but you know, you know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? It's, it's, it's good to have the asset and to have options uh, for sure. And uh, yes. presumably you did get, you know, built up. I mean, it's great that you were buying them and flipping, you know, buying them, renovating them. And so you obviously had a lot of equity in them, especially, the equity you, you bought by buying them cheap and the equity from owning them five, six years during, you know, some nice appreciation. So, but I, sorry, I sidetracked you. So what, what do you tell me again? What, what do you look for in a deal? What, what boxes does it need to check? Right. For right? Yeah. So uh, here's a, uh, one way to summarize exactly what we our niche here. So we want a B class property. We mm -hmm. want it to be in a B class neighborhood. We're going to rent it to a B class tenant and we want it to feel like an A class property. So that, and that means in terms of our finishes. So we, we pay a little extra, we're putting quartz countertops, uh, stainless appliances, tile backsplashes, tile bathrooms, uh, the flooring will always be hardwood or vinyl plank. Um, so, uh, but getting a little bit more specific, what the numbers look like is they're gonna be properties that uh, are renovated and sell between 140,000 and 200,000. That's okay. our niche here that keeps us in those boxes I just said. And these are single family homes in kind of upper middle class neighborhoods? Yeah, uh, yeah. so just to clarify, single family townhomes, uh, okay. which in Baltimore is a little unique because not every market is like that, but here, that's the majority of the housing stock, especially in this price point. Gotcha. Um, so get people and are these older homes, homes where you have to do a really big $70,000 renovation on them? 100%. Did I send you that ahead of time or something? But no, I'm no. Just kidding. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, these are older homes, a lot, mostly built between 1900 and 1950. And we really focus on the ones that need a full rehab. We're not looking for a light rehab, uh, cause we want to do everything to it. We want to do it our way. That way we know it's going to be predictable, uh, once we move a tenant in. So if we have our roof, our HVAC, our hot water heater, we've redone all the electric and all the plumbing, we know our, any issues that come up are going to be very minor and we have the people already to fix them. Um, we learned the hard way that, you know, when you buy a property from a seller and you're trusting their four year old roof and their six year old furnace, uh -huh. uh, and you get in there and the furnace is actually 14 years old and it blows up six months later, uh, you really shot yourself in the foot. So it's just much easier for us to focus on and do our own full renovation. Each time. That's true. So can you, you know, speaking of that, can you remember any, you know, bad mistakes you made in the early days where you kind of lost your shirt and then learned, learned something valuable that, that stood by you? Yeah. I mean, that, Oh man, there's a lot of those stories. I mean, I know anybody that's bought hundreds of properties. I, and like you, I've made tons of mistakes on, you know, six figure mistakes. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> give me yeah. something juicy. <laughs> uh, there's two, two interesting ones that come to mind. So again, if you're buying an older property, this older property also has an older sewer line. You can't see it. It's underground. It comes out from the house, goes out to the, the sewer line in the street. So we just didn't know. We had never really dealt with this. In, uh, even in all the flips that we did, it was, never really came up. Maybe like once, but it wasn't a big deal. So uh, we had a rental and we, the tenants moved in. We had done a full renovation to it. And uh, they kept complaining about like the, the basement floor was getting damp. And we're we went to the house. I was there We had all kinds of people there, waterproofers. So like we, we honestly cannot figure out, like there's no water coming from the outside. It has neighbors on both sides. Their basements are dry. 
what is the issue? So uh, we'll try to keep it as clean as possible. But we found out the sewer line under the basement floor had totally failed. It was just like an open area now. So there was literally sewage yeah. seeping against the basement floor. Uh, so the lesson there that we've learned thousands of dollars later was we can pay a plumber when we buy a house and they can take a camera and they can camera line the sewer underground. We can see yeah. exactly what we're dealing with and any issues we have to deal with up front um, because that was a really messy one. So, it's a lot cheaper than getting a guy to jackhammer the basement floor and yeah, and having yeah. to deal with the cleanup of all that. So uh, that was an interesting lesson. Luckily, I learned it pretty early. Um, and it still happens, but now if you catch it at the beginning, you just build it into your budget and it's over with. Um, yeah. Yeah. Another, so what, uh, yeah, ahead, I'm sorry. What's the other one? No, go ahead. What's the next one? Uh, I was just going to say another uh, infamous deal. Uh, Ellendale mm -hmm. was the street name. Uh, I, I take responsibility. I, I bought a house um, that had a hole in the roof. Sounds pretty good. Okay. Cool. The hole was now about eight feet in diameter. Um, nice. wow. And so obviously the hole had been growing for many, many years. And it was a, a rancher. The hole went straight to the basement. It had already eaten through the, the uh, flooring on the first floor. Uh, and oddly enough, the, the home seller did still live in the house with this. For oh, Jesus. Years. So uh, really long story short, we thought we could save the house. We decided we got this grand idea with our architect that we're going to tear the house down and rebuild a two-story colonial on the existing foundation. Um, yeah. Through a lot of lack of knowledge, human error, uh, poor project management, and maybe some misguided advice, uh, a year later, we still had a foundation sitting there with nothing built on it. Uh, and then we had to actually tear out the foundation because at this point now the rainwater had, had ruined the foundation. So uh, <laughs> this just drug out. So uh, after all that, we ended up selling the lot losing our tail on it. Uh, another builder built a beautiful house there. And our it's biggest okay. lesson there was if you don't, like we don't know how to build homes. We know how to renovate homes. We can renovate the hardest of homes. We don't yeah. have anybody on our team that knows new construction. So mm -hmm. if you're going to do something like that, you need to find a, I don't want to say a guru, but a, a trusted advisor, somebody that does that uh, or has the knowledge uh, if you're going to venture into something totally new, you, you got to learn from, from somebody else. Uh, yeah. Don't try to forge your own path because <laughs> it might really bite you in the butt. Yeah. I mean, look, it, learning something new is, is all well and good and, and, and growing on to the next thing. Once you've mastered fix and flips, it's perfectly normal to try and master new construction. But there's going to be a period there where you have to spend a ton of time learning about it and maybe bringing in experts uh, and, and then doing it because it's totally different skill. I don't have the skill set for building yeah. either. And I wouldn't, you know, uh, the same thing would happen to me if I tried to do it that happened to you probably something similar I just waste a year of my time and a ton of money and get nowhere right um, so but yeah lesson learned um so what what are the, the these houses you, you buy a nice house you, you fix it up it's worth about one hundred and forty thousand dollars with new everything what's that uh, what's that renting for uh so one of the things that i love and we love about this market is how well the rent prices align with our sale prices so that 140 house probably rents for 13 to 1400 dollars. Uh, a 165 house probably rents for 15 to 1600. Um, even as we push higher on price up to that mm -hmm. 200 mark, the rent range is still very closely aligned. Um, it's not until we go over 200 that that gets further away. So a 250 house, for example, might only rent for 2,000. And then right. the higher we go, the, the less they align. So we have a great sweet spot. And the other great thing is that $1,300 to $1,800 rent range is our biggest renter population in Baltimore. So okay. the demand is crazy, um, really crazy. And then the other win-win is that the vast majority of homes for rent are not fully renovated. And if they are, typically they might be rental grade. They're not really anything. Yeah, not getting the quartz um, and the stainless steel and the right. floors and yeah. So it really puts, sets us apart in, in tenants know that and they, they look for our homes. Um, and as a result, I'd like to think of everything I mentioned, the, the quality of the house, the management and the location. Uh, we, we hover around a 90% renewal rate um, and that's historical over five years now. So we've really done a good job of avoiding turnover, which is obviously 
kind of the name of the game for, for success. Okay. So the, the gross rents are very strong. You're close to the 1% rule if, you know, $140,000 yeah. house is renting for 13, 1400. So what, what about the other fees? What are property taxes like? What, what, what are property management fees? Yeah. So uh, we'll start with property management. We're, we're really low priced on that right now. Um, I, in full disclosure, we will likely be increasing them at some point, but getting started in turnkey, we're about a year in now. Uh, we, we intentionally made them low. So we charge 6% um, oh, wow. standard one month placement fee. Uh, and then we only charge a hundred dollar renewal fee. Um, Very low. Yeah. Pro property taxes are a little unique in Maryland. So and in a lot of States, when, some, when you buy a house, you get a new tax bill based on the sale price. Yeah. Uh, they, they don't do it like that here. Uh, you have a tax assessment, which really has no way, no, like there's no corresponding with the sale price. Um, it's not recalculated when a property transfers. So a lot of our properties are assessed, actually all of them are assessed lower than the market value of the house. And mm -hmm. then the assessments ends up producing a tax amount uh, on a normal property for us. Going to be anywhere between five hundred dollars and two thousand dollars is typically the range, and that's per year uh, for the sure. annual amount. Um, so not not crazy expensive on the, the property. So how, what would the ballpark be for that one hundred and forty thousand dollars house? What would the property taxes be? The, they they tend to be in the lower end, so going to likely be between five hundred and twelve hundred dollars. It's pretty good, and, it, and it's pretty bizarre. I could sell five properties at one hundred and forty. And one might be 500, one might be a thousand, the next one might be 900. It's a, and do you, it's do you know that science. in advance of, of we do. before you yeah. renovate it and, and sell it, you're going to be able to give a, obviously you can't give exact numbers, but you can give yeah. more accurate yeah. estimates for the location. And, and yeah, the, the assessment assess only changes once every three years. So we know exactly where a property is in its assessment range, uh, which makes it very predictable, which is nice. So, yep. Okay. Well, cool. Well, tell me, so how do you find all of these uh, great deals, all of these kind of, you know, run down houses that you turn into beautiful houses? What, what kind of marketing uh, are you doing? Or are you just buying them in auctions and not doing much marketing? No, I, I would venture to say we kind of do it all. So uh, we have okay. a re relatively large acquisitions team now, and we break it down into two kind of segments. I'll say one is on market and the other is off market. So on market, uh, I have a, a girl named Lauren. She does a great job. She sits at a computer all day, every day. And all she does is scrub properties from the MLS, auction.com, the courthouse auctions, just anywhere that there's a property posted online, uh, local Facebook groups, everything. Uh, right. she'll, she'll scan it and look for properties that fit our box. Of course, by box, we mean the price point, uh, the right areas, Typically, again, going to be a row home, not some big 3,000 square foot detached house. Um, so if, yep. if it fits the box, she'll run the numbers on it. If it's anywhere close to a deal, she'll send out our estimator, Steve. Steve will estimate the cost of the renovation. He'll send that back to Lauren. And then so he, Steve drives out there, does he, and, and yeah. takes photos of it? And Yep, that's Steve's full-time job. So Steve okay. is expected to hit anywhere between eight and 10 properties a day. Wow. Uh, okay. And, and send in renovation estimates for that. Uh, so we, we haven't trained, we have a software and everything that uh, we're plugging all this into. And then Lauren's going to bring back to me if it's not a pass, like if we're passing on the house because it's next to a gas station, I don't need to look at the numbers. But if it's yep. a nice quiet street, uh, needs a full renovation, here are the numbers, X, Y, Z. She sends it to me. I'll say, okay, yes, buy it or offer this number whatever it may be, and then she'll mm -hmm. go through the offering process. So that's on market acquisitions. And what, what software do you use to, um, do you use the same software to, to track it and, and that Steve sends you information, one software and, and Lauren another software? What, what are you using to? Uh, we to are using, software? this is called uh, Smartsheet, which is just really a fancy Microsoft Excel. Um, and in that is, is a spreadsheet in the database. So we're not using estimating software, Okay. Um, we, we have a, we've built out another spreadsheet that we, he uses to estimate off of um, mm -hmm. and some built-in calculations and stuff. Um, and then Smartsheet houses all the information. So he'll submit it with the address. It'll get uploaded there. Lauren can view it, move it around from hot to cold or to pass, whatever it is. Um, that way, if a property comes on the market or back on the market that was on six months ago, we already have all the numbers. We can pull it up in one click uh, and it's housed there.
That's awesome. So does Steve have to come back to the office and sit at a desk to input all his stuff or does he have some way where he can get you the information from his car? Yeah, just a, he has an iPad that we bought uh, so he can submit it oh, right his iPad in the car. So we keep it moving. Yep. That's awesome. And then, okay, so that's the on-market stuff, stuff that you can see is for sale or coming up for auction. And then yep. it sounds like you have another ring for the, the off-market direct mail. Concept. Yeah, so off-market is a totally separate team of people. Um, okay. Uh, if you look at it as a factory kind of pipeline, at the beginning of the pipeline is lead generation. Uh, so we, we do still do direct mail. Uh, we have uh, SEO, pay-per-click. Um, we've uh, tried TV, didn't really have great success with it. So we've gone away from that again. I've had other people try TV without success as well, yeah. Yeah, I've heard of some people that have really hit it out of the park, but for us, it, it just never really worked quite right. So we, we turned that off uh, earlier in, early in this year. Um, and I feel like I'm missing at least one other way, but so off market, we're really look, looking to generate our own leads. Oh, outbound is what we do. Um, can you but this is call, calling, calling people uh, that might be going through pre foreclosure or divorces or is that what you mean? Yeah, correct. Uh, they're on some kind of mailing list that, that we've developed. Uh, they could be vacant owners, um, long time owners, high equity, anything that fits a, a certain box. So, uh, we do our lead generation, we have leads coming in, uh, or ones that respond to the outbound stuff. Um, from there, we will try to set an appointment and or gather all the information. Uh, so I'll review it with our ISA and we'll decide pretty easily, uh, you know, if the house is in perfect condition, they owe a fair amount on the mortgage, they've owned it for four years, it's not going to be a buy for us, right? Yeah, they're not, not a distressed seller. Um, you know, we can then refer that to one of our agents to go try to get the listing if they're, if they're actually going to sell. Sure. Yeah. Um, if it's a townhouse in Baltimore that needs a lot of work, uh, our seller just inherited the house, they don't want to deal with it, this is perfect. This is likely going to be a turnkey for us, or it could be a wholesale if the numbers don't work, right? Uh, so we'll send out one of our acquisitions agents, which is a true sales job, They'll meet with the seller and they'll try to, yeah. to, to agree to a contract price and then we'll put it into our system from there. Um, and so what, are, go ahead. yeah, they're, they're two, yeah, the two, two big machines. So what percentage of deals do you think you get from each? Oh, um, <clears throat> what percentage do we get from each? It's close to 50, 50. We get a good amount from both. The biggest thing we've learned is we just have to be consistent in what we're doing. So, and, and are your profit margins better with, with off market than on market or is yes, this, they, this they are? Yeah, they are. So we do buy some on market from other wholesalers. Uh, sure. We consider that on market. It's not, it's not on the market, but because somebody else already has it under contract, we're buying it at a, at a fee. So mm -hmm. uh, that assignment fee is anywhere between three and $20,000 that in our mind is really lost profit. If we had found that seller first. Um, it is. And I've, I've bought loads of properties from wholesalers and obviously I'm not going to buy them unless I think I can make money on the other side. Right. So that's okay. But I, I, I didn't have the machine that you had for the direct morning. I kind of dabbled in it. I tinkered with it. I hired a guy to do it. Didn't work out. Spent a bunch of money like yeah. doing what I now see as half-hearted <laughs> yeah. attempts. Like you really have to go all in for, for months and, and really have good people negotiating. I'm not Somebody calls me and said, I'm thinking about selling my house because I owe a bunch of money and I'm, you know, got medical bills. I'm not very good at negotiating uh, sure. a weird situation. I don't, it's not part of my skill set. And obviously you have guys that are good at that and experienced at that. Yeah. Like you said, it, it's, uh, you definitely have to have the right people. You also have to develop the right system and then you got to track it. You got to understand what's working and what's not and make adjustments. So we track everything track everything actually weekly, some things daily, uh, weekly at minimum, and then also month end. Um, and that's how we decide what adjustments to make and changes to make. That's awesome. So that's a kind of a, a proper team meeting saying how, yep. how many leads, how many calls, how many profits, and you're just kind of learning, well, Outbound did very well this week. Let's try and bump that up and we're getting nowhere on TV. So cut that off. You're, you know, you're doing right. all that kind of adjusting. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. So let, let's talk about Baltimore for a minute, because that's that's where you're from. That's where all the business is. You're, you're selling these beautiful houses for one hundred and forty, fifty thousand dollars And if you ask 
most people probably listening to the show at Baltimore, they're not thinking that. They're thinking high crime. They're thinking inner city. They're thinking gritty TV shows. They're, they're thinking all other stuff. But I, I mean, I know the truth is a lot. They're from Baltimore. It's a big city. I mean, what, right. fill us in on, on what's, what's good about it and what's great about it for as, as a property investor and, and a place to live. Sure. Yeah. So I, it's great for a lot of reasons and not just because I'm from here and not just because we have Lamar Jackson, who is really awesome. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, let's just talk about the location itself. A lot of people don't realize that Baltimore is within an hour of Washington, D.C. Um, it's amazing for a lot of reasons. But of course, the federal government is borderline recession proof. They have their own issues, but there's so many jobs and there's such an economy around that federal government. Uh, which really is basically our backyard. And if you look at where DC is on the map, it's bordered, of course, by Northern Virginia. And then to the Northeast, we have some suburbs from the Maryland side. Uh, Those are some of the most expensive zip codes in the country. A lot of people don't know that. So if you're deciding, if you wanna live or work in DC, but don't live there, the next closest place that is still a metro area and has a lot to do is Baltimore. So we have a ton of spillover and commuters that live, work in DC and live in Baltimore uh, or even just outside of Baltimore. Um, the other thing about our location is just geographically, we are right on I-95, which runs all the way to Florida and of yeah. runs all the way north. Uh, we are a coastal city, so we have the, the harbor and the port of Baltimore uh, is, comes right into the middle of the city. Uh, and then we have another uh, Interstate 70 goes straight west Uh, out to the Midwest and connects to 68, which goes even further west. So for companies like Amazon and all these other supply chain logistics companies, Baltimore Mm -hmm. is a really strategic spot. So Amazon, UPS, FedEx, all these companies that have boomed through COVID rely heavily on Baltimore and have massive operations here. There's tons of jobs. Um, So the federal government, uh, the supply chain and logistics and Amazon world uh, are just two of the really big economy factors here. Um, Another one, of course, is like a lot of cities, we have several really big hospital systems, but most people know Hopkins. Uh, So Johns Hopkins, the hospital system and the university are based right in Baltimore, uh, along with several other really big universities. Um, So it's just a really diverse job field. And as we look at the stats, and we've tracked them over the the months coming out of COVID or in COVID, whatever you want to say, um, Maryland is in the top 10 or very close to it for unemployment. Um, and that's true in Baltimore as well, where Baltimore really is in the heart of Maryland. So um, because, I think that has a lot to do with it being such a diverse economy. Um, so when you say top 10 for unemployment, do you mean they're one of the top 10 for, for keeping unemployment low, one of the lowest unemployment Right, one rates. of the lowest rates, yeah, yeah, right. yeah in the country. Um, so, and then that's another great. analogy I'll use, uh, I was talking to a customer from California and uh, she said, you know, I, I tell people, she lives in the Bay Area now, but she lived in Oakland for many years. And I guess to Californians, when they hear Oakland, they go, ooh, Oakland? And she goes, no, Oakland's actually really nice. You know, it, it has its rougher areas, but it's a, it's a great place to be. Uh, but a lot of people paint it with a broad brush. It's sure. the same exact thing for Baltimore. Um, you know, is it New York City? Is it Washington, D.C.? Absolutely not. It's a very different city. Uh, does it have some significant issues in certain areas? Absolutely. But the vast majority of people are normal, hardworking. There's a huge middle-class population. Um, and that's really where we operate. Uh, so we don't have any interest in being in the worst areas in Baltimore. Uh, no different sure. than other cities in the country. We wouldn't likely want to be in the worst areas there. Uh, we really want to be in that middle ground where uh, it's safe to walk around. We can send our people to work there without any issues or concerns. Um, and we can, we can run a business there and have for many years. So, uh, that, that's my, that's my short spiel on it. Yeah, no, and I agree with you. And, and look, if you're, you're renting properties for, you know, 1300 to $1,800, you're, you're in, you're in pretty nice areas. Uh, and that's the same in, in Tampa where, you know, the houses I, I own are generally rented for 1100 to $1,500 as well. I can sure. buy in areas of Tampa where the rents are, five or 600 a month, but they're pretty rough areas. And, and obviously right. there's places in Baltimore where the rents are five or 600 a month and you're, you're not buying and, and selling those to out-of-state investors either. I mean, there'll be some exactly. local landlords that build those portfolios, but that's different kind of deal. And that's not what your business does. It's not what my business does. You're, you're sticking with upper middle-class safe areas and that, that's, 
the safest place to be as an owner and, and selling to out-of-state investors. I think it's, it's sure. a smart plan and sounds like your, your numbers are, are pretty good. Um, and I'm glad that you said the unemployment didn't take as big a hit as, as nearly any other city. So what, how was COVID-19? Because it's, you know, you're working in an office with, with 15, 16 people. You got a ton of moving parts. Uh, you're ordered to shut down in, in March. That must have been quite a shock to the system. Yeah, and the shock is, I think, definitely the, the best word. It just it happened so quickly, too. It was kind of like uh, we came in on Thursday and, you know, you hear rumblings and the things are kind of happening. And then by Friday afternoon, it's everybody go home and I don't, we don't know when we'll see you again. So uh, we, I, we actually, at, at this point now, uh, early in the year, we're at, I think I want to say, 26 or 27 team members wow, uh, okay. employees. So, um, yeah, it was a, a massive change. So the one good thing for us was locally, the Maryland governor uh, very quickly released classifications of what was considered essential and property management, residential construction, uh, and, and real estate stuff like that was considered essential. So we could remain operational, uh, but everybody was immediately working from home. Uh, of course, our construction guys are out in the field anyway, so they're not really in the office, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the most part, looking back, I'd say it probably went as smoothly as it could. There's a, a lot of a learning curve and, and trying to transition to all virtual meetings and uh, acquiring safety equipment for our guys in the field. And right. uh, our, like our maintenance guys going into tenants' homes, we had to quickly uh, get all kinds of PPE stuff that we didn't really need before. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of changes, but uh, we were able to not lay anybody off. Uh, Great. We were able to keep leasing homes and moving people in and keep construction moving. Um, you know, that's not to say uh, the permit office wasn't a total disaster because it was. <laughs> oh, I bet. Yeah. Uh, you Good. know, inspection timeframes got moved out weeks and it was all kinds of issues there, but it seems to mostly be resolved at this point. So, yeah. That's brilliant. Shock is a good word though. I, I, yeah, and, and I, obviously initially, you're, I'm sure your, your acquisitions took, took a dive until you recalibrated the whole business again. I mean, how is it, how's it looking now? Is, do you still have half your people at home or all of them at home? And, you know, are you, are you back to like 80% of where you were acquisition-wise now? Or how's, that, how's it look in the next few months? Yeah, uh, so yes, in the immediate, let's say it was March 20th or something like that, is when it really got shut down. Uh, I'd say that next month was really quiet, um, sure. just across the board. I mean, it was really, really quiet for a lot of different things. And then finally in April, or maybe it was late April, it was like all of a sudden it just started to pick back up again. And ever since then, I, I'd say for the past couple months now, we've been very steady. We're, we're at our numbers before COVID. Um, you know, the, the market is hot. Everybody kind of knows the market is hot now. Uh, yeah. So the, the volume of sales has picked back up locally. Uh, again, we were fortunate in our niche, again, looking at middle-class renters, these are people that continue to move. Um, if you look at the, I'll say like the highest class of renters, like this class A, you know, doctors and stuff, I think that activity has, has really been a lot slower. But inside the middle-class world, people still need to move. They're changing jobs or getting a new job, whatever the case may be. Um, that, that population has continued to move and uh, the rental demand, again, from end of March to early April was definitely quieter. But after that, it spiked uh, and it's yeah. remained really high. So, yeah. I think we're fortunate to be working in an industry that has proven to be incredibly resilient to the pandemic. I mean, touch wood, it'll, it'll stay that way, certainly with the, the inventory and the demand yeah. and the interest rates being held down for another three years. It's, it, it, you know, who knows where this is going to go. I think there might be a spike in, in some foreclosure auctions and evictions, but doesn't yeah. look like there's going to be a nationwide property crisis or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. The biggest crisis seems to be inventory, which is uh, not what we all predicted at the beginning. I mean, we, we talked to a lot of really smart people and ourselves included, not that I'm that smart, but, you know, we thought this is it. For years, people have been saying there's a bubble. Right, it's gonna fall. The bottom's gonna fall out. Value's gonna go down. Inventory's gonna expand, and it's like the total opposite happened. <laughs> it's pretty interesting in, in hindsight. So. And I don't know what to make of it. I mean, maybe maybe it's two thousand and four, and people are like, it has to stop. It can't keep going up, and it did, right. but only for another two years. I mean, it real estate is cyclical. It is. It Absolutely. does. You do have bell curves, and it's 
you know, this is a funny shaped belt because it's been going up since 2011 or 12. Yeah. I mean, it has to come yeah. down eventually, but it, it's not going to be this year. That's for sure. Sure, well, not for sure. I'm never going to say that's for sure, but it well, yeah, that's <laughs> doesn't, true. Everything can doesn't change look like it. Yeah. I mean, we're still in the middle of a health crisis. You know, I mean, the, the yeah. economic crisis seems to have been, those flames have been dampened by, you know, lots of money being thrown at it. But uh, yeah, the health crisis is still there <laughs> yeah. and we're, neither of us are qualified to figure that out, you know. Absolutely. But, but yeah, let me look. You've done really well for yourself, Sander. You're 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 a pretty young guy, and you've done well, and you've you've played a key part in growing a very cool business. I mean, if if there was one person that had the biggest impact on your career, who who would you say that was? Um, uh, well, I mean, I could easily say two people. One being my business partner, but I, I'm going to actually flip back to uh, the broker, the the one who got me into real estate, got me excited about it and then taught me so many lessons in such a short period of time. And then also introduced me to my uh, partner. So uh, she really, uh, I, maybe knowingly or unknowingly, but truly changed the trajectory of my life uh, in that, that two or three year window. So uh, that's pretty cool. It's, it's definitely looking back one of the most key moments in, in my, the past 10 years of my life. Yeah, yeah, no, cool. I, I, I agree with you. So what do you, uh, rewinding that, what do you do for fun? Obviously, you're a busy guy. you got real estate, a lot of real estate going on. I mean, what do you do for fun? Do you have hobbies? Do you, do you have a lot of free time for hobbies? I wouldn't say too much. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so I'm really into cars. Uh, I've always been a car guy, even before, even since I was a kid. Uh, cars have always been a passion of mine. So, uh, of course, this year there's been far fewer meetups, but I'll try to go to meetups and things like that. Um, I enjoy just driving in general. I, I drive, uh, I, I say it humbly, but uh, I, I drive unique cars. I, I only have one car at a time, but I seem to get new cars somewhat often. Um, so I well, what, really what are you like driving? What's, what's the cool car that you got now? Uh, so it's going to throw you off unless you know cars, but it's a, it's a Jeep, but it's, a, it's called a Trackhawk. Um, so it has the uh, 700 horsepower Hellcat engine in it. Wow. And, uh, it's like scary fast actually so it's, it's really fun to drive because you look at it and you're like it's just a jeep uh, but then you drive it and you're like wow this doesn't feel like got a rocket inside it yeah wow. yeah it's pretty fun um but yeah then other, other than that uh, i live with my my girlfriend and my dog i uh, love baltimore sports team so uh, you know in normal times i would have been at the football game last weekend but uh, that wasn't an option so <laughs> uh, but, it, uh, yeah, normal stuff to try to travel and have fun and, and go to new places very cool. Um, well, look, before we sign off, there's a lot of young people listening to this show that are looking to get started in real estate and grow their wealth. Are there any, any good books you'd recommend they get stuck into now or, or any other kind of general pieces of advice you could, you could give someone to get them started or, or just accelerate their real estate journey? Yeah. Um, and, well, a couple of things. I tell anybody young that I meet in real estate, um, I, I tell them what I learned, which is you're going to want to quit. And you're going to want to quit several times, uh, not just once, because it's really hard to get going. Once you have momentum, then you look back and you're like, oh, okay, I made it through that. But you're going to hit that wall several times. So you, you just you can't quit. You have to keep going. I've, I've met so many people over the years uh, that were impressed that I'm in real estate being a younger person. I'm 30 now, but I'm, again, I'm almost 10 years in. And they all say the same thing. They're like, I wish I was in real estate when I was younger or when I was your age. So if you're already having, if you're young and you're already having the real estate conversation, you're a step ahead. If you're getting into it, you got to jump in and you, and you got to fight through it. Um, so other than that, the biggest thing I tell people is you have to learn. So you should read books, a lot of them. You also want to study and read online. The more you understand, the more you know, the easier it'll be to find your niche. You can't be good at everything. You got to pick a couple of things at the most and be great at those. Uh, if you try to be good at 10 things, you might be average at seven and not good at three. So uh, yeah. it's really got to find that niche and uh, figure out what works for you. Um, but just going back to what we spent so much time on, I'm biggest on rental properties. I think, uh, especially for people that work full time, not in real estate, rentals are going to be the vehicle to, for them to generate a lot of wealth over the years uh, and grow their net worth. And then also hopefully have, you know, extra monthly income. Um, which it, God forbid they have a job change or something else is still going to be mm -hmm. there. So I'm really huge on that model. I have that conversation with my own family uh, and, and my friends. 
Uh, so that, yeah, I'm, I'm really big on that. That's awesome. Some really good advice there. Thank you, Alex. Um, so how can people get in touch with you if they want to reach out to you after the show? Where do they go? Yeah, so the easiest way is just through our website. Uh, so it's crofmaryland.com. So uh, you can click on the turnkey tab. You can click on the contact us tab, but if you go to the turnkey page uh, and then click to sign up there, uh, that comes directly to my inbox. Uh, you can also feel free to email me. It's alexander at crofmaryland.com. Uh, cool. All great ways to get in touch. All right, I'll put that in the show notes. And uh, yeah, thanks t- again for your, your time, but I appreciate the insights and uh, yeah, keep, keep, keep selling, keep networking. Thanks again. Thanks, Colin. Good to see you again. So there you have it, folks. That was uh, Alexander or Xander Cruz from CR of Maryland, uh, seller of a lot of properties in the Baltimore area. Sells a lot of properties to out-of-state investors. He, him and his business partner, Craig, own a very large portfolio of, of properties that throws up a lot of passive income. A very nice guy, very, very interesting guy, uh, humble guy, uh, humble with his success, but clearly a very hard worker, a grafter, guy that's got through, you know, the same kind of problems and obstacles that anybody that's had to kind of build or, or co-build a business would have to go through. And I think his advice at the end to resist that urge to, to give up every time you hit a speed bump is, is very salient advice because, you know, anything worth doing is, is, is going to be difficult. I mean, building... Getting that initial momentum in real estate is, is very hard. Uh, it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort, and you have to work much harder uh, than a normal person would. The, the first ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars you earn in real estate is, is tough to earn a lot of the time, unless you get lucky. But once you get momentum, it gets a lot easier, and it can be a very, very rewarding career. It enables you to manage your own time, to build up passive income streams. To, to build your own business network with the right kinds of people, learn from others. It gives you a lot of freedom and, it, and it's a fantastic way of, of building wealth, especially if you start young. You know, there's a big difference between starting at 25 versus 35 versus 45. But, you know, the best time to start is, is always now. I mean, it's, you can say it was 10 years ago, but realistically, you know, it's, it's, it's never too late to start. But if you're a young person listening to this, don't, don't wait until you know, you're, you're older and wiser, just start doing it now, start talking to people now, start dipping your toe in the water, start learning and reading. And you're obviously already listening to this podcast. So thank you for that. And uh, I think real estate can be very rewarding. And I, I, I'm not scared about investing in, in real estate now. I had my worries about it back in, in March, April, May, but um, not, not so much anymore. And um, yeah, I think it's the next three, six, nine months are are going to be a fantastic time to be in real estate, whether that's flipping houses or expanding your portfolio. I I do think there's going to be, uh, you know, big increases in in evictions and foreclosures. There's going to be a lot of opportunities to purchase real estate in the foreclosure auctions. That's one of my specialties. I'm I'm going to be offering uh, platforms to, to educate people on that. If you want to learn more, just reach out to me. And uh, yeah, thanks as for listening. As always, if uh, you like this show, do give me a rating or a review on whatever platform you use. If uh, you know if you're able to share this with your friends, that'd be super helpful as well, just to get the word out. I appreciate it, and I'll be back very soon with uh, show 18. Thanks again for for tuning in. Uh, this is me, Colin Murphy, podcasting about real estate. Signing out. Uh, see you again soon, guys. Bye bye.